I'm Amber Lease from UC Irvine, and I'm delighted to present the harvest of the fibula free flap. Our only disclosure is that I am a speaker for oxygen and checkpoint. Segmental diaphyseal defects of long bones are a challenging problem and can be caused by trauma, infection, tumors, or congenital differences. Classically, defects smaller than 5 to 6 centimeters in the extremities can be treated with non-vascularized bone grafting or shortening, while larger defects or defects recalcitrant to other grafting methods require reconstructive procedures. There are numerous reconstructive options for diaphyseal defects, each with advantages and disadvantages. Options for the management of large defects include distraction osteogenesis, the mascalay technique, bulk allograft or allograft prosthetic composites, endoprostheses, and vascularized bone grafting. Ultimately, the choice of procedure should be tailored to the individual situation. Bone grafts can broadly be divided into non-vascularized and vascularized grafts. The success of non-vascularized bone grafting depends on the blood supply of the recipient bone and the surrounding tissues. Without an adequate blood supply, non-vascularized grafts are incapable of remodeling and the transplanted bone can fail to unite with the recipient bone and be subject to necrosis. This is not the case with vascularized grafts in which the graft is transferred with its own vascular supply. Most cells will remain alive, preserving bone remodeling, and the bone is able to integrate in hypertrophy. In these instances, the graft and recipient bone both show similar healing characteristics to those of a simple fracture. The free fibula flap allows the transfer of a diaphyseal segment of the fibula with or without skin or muscle on a vascular pedicle consisting of the perineal artery and its vena comitans. This allows the transfer to a distant site for segmental defect reconstruction. In addition to the inherent benefits of vascularized bone grafting, the free fibula flap has the advantage of being able to provide immediate mechanical support when combined with internal fixation. Additionally, if the recipient site has a soft tissue defect, vascularized muscle and skin can be harvested with the bone flap for reconstruction. The free fibula flap has been described for both upper and lower extremity as well as head, neck, and spinal reconstructive procedures. While a pedicled fibula flap was first performed for ipsilateral tibial reconstruction in 1905, Taylor is credited as having performed the first free vascularized fibula flap in 1975 to reconstruct a contralateral tibial defect. Gilbert then modified the surgical approach in 1979 to a lateral approach to harvest, which is today the most commonly used method. Other described modifications of the flap include the harvest of osteomuscular, osteocutaneous, proximal epiphyseal, or double-barreled flaps. There are many situations in which a free fibula flap may be of benefit. Indications have ranged from traumatic bony defects greater than 6 centimeters in length, bony defects after tumor surgery, resistant pseudoarthrosis, limb length discrepancy, chronic osteomyelitis with bone loss, mandibular reconstruction, vascularized epiphyseal transfer for the growing skeleton, osteonecrosis of the head of the humerus or femur, and other situations where large vascularized bone graft is needed. Contraindications to the free fibula flap include absent vessels at the donor or recipient site, peripheral vascular disease involving the lower extremity, a hypoplastic anterior tibial artery, need for a large skin paddle at the recipient site, venous insufficiency, deep vein thrombosis, history of contralateral lower extremity amputation, and active infection at the donor or recipient site. The free fibula flap is based on perineal artery perforators to the periosteum, with the predominant nutrient vessel entering the fibula in the posterior middle third, approximately 17 centimeters distal to the styloid. The flap can be harvested with a skin paddle up to 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters. The perineal artery pedicle is 2 to 3 millimeters in diameter and accompanied by two vena comitantes, which can be used for venous drainage, and the pedicle length can be up to 15 centimeters. The average fibula length is 40 centimeters, and while allowing for some proximal and distal bone to remain in place for stability of the ankle, up to 30 centimeters of bone can be harvested for large defects. One should be aware that up to 10% of the population may have hypoplasia or an absence of one or both of the anterior and posterior tibial arteries, a condition called peronea arteria magna, and free vascularized fibula flap harvest in these patients can severely compromise circulation to the foot. These studies have demonstrated that palpable pulses on clinical examination are not sufficient to rule out a peronea arteria magna. Preoperative imaging using CTA or MRA is recommended to evaluate for this, and if the results are equivocal, a more invasive and expensive angiography should be considered. The case is performed supine with a thigh tourniquet. The minimum instrumentation needed for harvest are listed. A two-team approach is ideally utilized, with one team performing the graft harvest and another preparing the recipient site. In the following videos, we will demonstrate our technique for the harvest of the free fibula flap. 
Relevant landmarks are the lateral malleolus and the proximal fibular head. The axis of the fibula can be visualized by connecting these points. The flap is marked by measuring 6 to 7 centimeters from the distal end to preserve ankle stability, and next, two points, 4 centimeters and 8 centimeters from the proximal fibular head are marked. Between these two points is where the common perineal nerve crosses the fibula. If a skin paddle is desired, the fibula is divided into thirds and the skin paddle outlined on the middle third, which will use perforator vessels. These vessels come through the intermuscular septum located just posterior to the axis of the bone. Once the paddle is marked, Doppler can be used to confirm the perforator. Flap marking in pediatric cases also begins by identifying the distal and proximal fibular head and creating an axis line over the bone. However, in children with size discrepancies, a proportional scaling approach is used for measurements. A body part on the surgeon that is 7 centimeters is compared to the same anatomical reference point on the child, and an appropriate conversion is made. A Doppler can still be used to identify the perforators. The initial dissection is performed under tourniquet control, and the tourniquet is released when working around the vascular pedicle. The skin incision for flap harvest can be a lazy S-shaped pattern or a straight line depending on the surgeon preference. If a skin paddle is being taken, the incision should begin on the anterior aspect of the leg. If no skin paddle is needed, the incision is made about one finger breadth posterior to the axis of the bone. Once the incision is made, the skin is elevated anteriorly to expose the underlying fascia of the pronius longus muscle. The maximum width of a skin paddle that allows for primary closure is typically between 4 to 6 centimeters. If a larger skin paddle is taken, one must be aware that the superficial peroneal nerve may be encountered in the initial dissection. Conceptually, when preparing to take a skin paddle, the peroneal artery is here, and its perforators course posteriorly to the fibula. To ensure the viability of these perforators and the skin paddle, identify the peroneus longus, and then incise and elevate its overlying fascia to reach the septum. After identifying the peroneus longus tendon, which is best seen distally, incise and open the muscle fascia. The peroneus longus muscle is then elevated and carefully separated from the underlying fascia to visualize the lateral intermuscular septum. The goal is to identify and preserve at least one, but ideally several perforating vessels. Preoperative Doppler markings can be helpful in this situation. If no perforators are seen at the septum, they may instead course intramuscularly through the FHL and soleus muscle. We'll be able to identify them when we get to our posterior incision. Continuing anteriorly, we proceed with electrocautery, leaving a 1-2 to two millimeter cuff of the peroneus longus and brevis on the bone to strictly avoid injuring the periosteum. The goal is to reach the intermuscular septum between this lateral and the anterior compartment. Be mindful to carefully position your retractors to avoid any stretch injury to the proximal portion of the perineal nerve. At this point of the dissection, the intermuscular septum is encountered. It will be opened and the anterior compartment elevated just enough to expose the interosseous membrane. Care is taken to avoid the nearby deep peroneal nerve and anterior tibial artery and vein. If the identification of the intermuscular septum and the interosseous membrane becomes difficult, the shape of the fibula can help, as there is a depression along the side of the bone to which the lateral compartment is attached. If this depression is seen, then the structure encountered is the intermuscular septum and not the interosseous membrane. As the intermuscular septum is being opened, the deep peroneal nerve and anterior tibial artery and vein are encountered medially, just under the tibialis anterior and EHL muscle. These are carefully elevated from the interosseous membrane. If a skin paddle is needed, the posterior skin incision is made now. From here, the dissection is carried down to the soleus muscle, and the fascia is opened and the skin paddle elevated anteriorly, protecting the exposed septal perforators. If the intermuscular perforators are needed, they are identified and preserved at this stage. Several may be found. If the muscular perforators are needed, they are harvested with a cuff of soleus muscle around them.
If a skin paddle is not needed, or the intermuscular perforators are not needed, the perforators are ligated. Next, the soleus muscle is separated from the fibula, while a small cuff of muscle is left on the fibula to again avoid damage to the periosteum. Care is taken to manage the large perforators to the gastrocnemius muscle during this portion of the dissection. The dissection should result in exposure of the interosseous membrane anteriorly, and posteriorly we should see the flexor hallucis longus. Next, the osteotomies are performed. A right angle or homen is placed at the distal and proximal osteotomy sites. When making cuts, care is taken to prevent transection of the artery, which is just deep to the bone. Clamps are used to aid in optimizing rotational control on the bone and to apply gentle traction. A small wedge of bone is removed distally to expand the working space for further dissection. Next, the interosseous membrane is divided to identify the peroneal artery distally, and keep in mind that this may be small in pediatric patients. In adult patients, the caliber should be 2-3 to three millimeters in diameter. To ensure adequate perfusion to the foot, prior to vessel harvest, the tourniquet is let down and an Ackland clamp is placed on the pedicle to assess flow to the foot. Next, the pedicle is ligated distally. The artery and vena comitants are ligated separately. The maximum length is harvested to preserve the ability to perform a reverse flow anastomosis as a bailout if needed. At this point of the dissection, the flap is only connected to the proximal perineal artery, flexor hallucis longus, tibialis posterior, and interosseous membrane. Starting distally and proceeding proximally, the interosseous membrane is incised 1 to 2 millimeters away from the fibula to protect the vessels. Bone clamps can help increase exposure here. With the interosseous membrane now open, the tibialis posterior and FHL muscles are carefully elevated off the fibula, again leaving a cuff of muscle to protect the periosteum. At the proximal termination of the FHL, the vessels will diverge from the bone and head medially to connect with the posterior tibial artery. The tibial nerve and posterior tibial artery and vein can be identified medially and care must be taken to avoid injury to these structures. Our flap should now be fully free. If additional osteotomies are needed for custom reconstruction, subperiosteomal cuts are performed to preserve the periosteum. And custom plating can be even done prior to flap harvest. Attention is then turned to the recipient site. The recipient site is prepared to the maximum amount before pedicle division to minimize ischemia time. The bone flap is fixated to the defect before performing the anastomosis to prevent inadvertent damage of the vessels. The microscope is then brought in and the perineal artery is anastomosed end-to-end -end or end-to-side to a recipient vessel. The donor vena comitants can be anastomosed with sutures or a vein coupler. The flexor hallucis longus muscle is resuspended to the soleus muscle or the interosseous membrane. The wound is closed over a drain while avoiding overtight closures, which increases the risk for wound healing complications at best and also compartment syndrome at worst. Skin grafting should be performed if there is any tension on the wound. Postoperatively, the ankle is splinted in a neutral position and the splint is removed at one week postoperatively to encourage ambulation. In addition, patients should be instructed to elevate the leg and wrap the leg with an ACE wrap for several weeks postoperatively to improve comfort and decrease edema. Systematic reviews of fibula free flaps have noted an overall complication rate of 33%, most of which are minor. Early complications include hemorrhage, hematoma, and thrombosis, which can all lead to flap loss. Late complications include nonunion, infection, fractures of the graft, and donor site morbidity, including pain, scarring, and loss of foot function. In this systematic review of the outcomes of free fibula flaps in the upper extremity, a flap survival rate of 97% and a union rate of 95 to 97% was reported. Thank you.